blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Amen. Let me pray. God of justice and peace, God of hope and healing, faithful Father, loving Son, generous Spirit, teach us how to live. Lead us onto the right paths. Renew our strength and imagination. Give us the courage we need to walk and work with you. We say yes to all that you're doing and have yet to do. Let your kingdom come in and through our lives. We surrender to your will and to your ways. Amen. Well, I'm excited to finally be able to share with you the work that I've been doing over the last two or three months, preparing for this new teaching series that we are going to be doing in the run up to Easter Sunday together. Over the last, um, over the next six weeks, rather, we're going to be doing an in-depth study of the, the, the text from Matthew chapter five that we just read together. Maybe you're familiar with it. It's a portion of Matthew's gospel called the Beatitudes, which is essentially a, a gateway text into a much wider set of teachings, better known uh, as the Sermon on the Mount, or even uh, some people will describe it the teaching on the hill that runs not just through Matthew chapter five, but into Matthew chapter six and on into uh, Matthew chapter seven. And I've found it very interesting and deeply challenging to sit with these words over the last two or three months. The temptation, I've been struck by how tempted I was at times just to jump right in, get all of the bases covered, meet the themes head on, and almost as if to teach it like it's curriculum. But to unlock the meaning behind this set of blessings, we actually need to take a different type of approach. And that's where I wanted to start this morning. We need to read these words with the one who taught them. We need to read these words with the one who taught them. And these challenging words are not just a checklist of things to get done. They are an invitation to participate in something no, much bigger and longer lasting, to become a people that are walking in step with God's inbreaking now and not yet kingdom. Sounds exciting, doesn't it? My goal for today is just to do two things, essentially. Firstly, I want us to do some background work together, to kind of zoom out, as it were, and to see the text from a wider vantage point, okay? And then, I hope, armed with some new and fresh perspective, I want us to begin the process of engaging with this text called Beatitudes, starting today with verse 3. So let's make a start. If you've got a Bible, a physical Bible with you, open it up. If you read your Bible when you come to church on your phone, why don't you open your phone up um, to Matthew chapter 4, okay? We'll get to chapter 5, but why don't we start by looking at Matthew chapter 4 together. Some of this may sound like uh, the lyrics of the song, All Things New, that we were singing earlier, um, but it's fascinating 
when God does that, when there's a sense of connection between what we've been singing and how we've been worshiping and what the scriptures are saying also. So um, this will just prompt us uh, along. So Jesus, if, you, if, you're, if you're looking at the text open in front of you, Jesus um, has just been te- tested, tempted in the wilderness, and he's beginning his public ministry, okay? Chapter 4, uh, verse 16. And Matthew does this fascinating thing in, in, in that place. He, he, pro- he, he quotes the prophet Isaiah, and Matthew tells us about he, he's, he's keen to, to grab a hold of our interests and our imagination and to tell us about a people who are sitting in darkness. A people who are sitting in darkness, seeing a great light. Now, what's interesting, really interesting, if we dig down into the, the language here, the word that Matthew uses here for sitting is actually quite significant. It means to stay still, to sit still, like a seed does in the ground, doing nothing, waiting for release, longing, as it were, to spring into action and into life. Amazing language in the Greek. And similarly with the word that's used for light here, it's not just light like we would have um, in in the sun, it's actually a lot more specific than that. It refers to the light of dawn, to the beginning of a new day. So people who are sitting like a seed in the ground, waiting for release, see a great light. They see this wonder, this beginning of something new. Even the word for shined at the end of the sentence, a light has shined, verse 16 ends. It means something new is rising up, springing forth, even being born. This language and imagery here in one single verse of chapter 4 is phenomenally important for constructing our sense of what it is that Matthew is trying to piece together for us. Waiting and longing for release. Can you relate? The dawn of a new day. Something new being, springing up and being born. Jesus, Matthew wants us to be clear on this. Jesus is beginning a new era for God's people. This is almost so incredibly important, like 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 a pair of glasses, like lenses, to see the Beatitudes through. Jesus is beginning a new era for God's people and for God's world. Things may not have been clear for a long time for God's people. And Matthew wants us to understand that was all about the change. In and through the person and work of Jesus Christ, in the power of the Spirit, everything was about to change. God is acting in and through Jesus, not just to turn the world upside down, but to turn Israel upside down and to pour out his lavish blessings on everyone who would turn to him and to accept the new things that he was doing. And it's here then, I and mean, this is interesting, you don't always kind of think of it this succinctly, that in verse 17, if you've got the text open in front of you, he, Matthew goes on to tell us the very first things that Jesus says in his public preaching ministry. If you've still got the text open in front of you, turn to verse 17 with me. Repent, Jesus says. Repent, Jesus says. In the Greek language, the word that's used here is metanoia. It means to expand your thinking. Essentially, what Jesus is saying is, think bigger. Think bigger, people. Think bigger, church. And he goes on to say this, the kingdom or the rule and the reign of God in and through the person of Jesus is near. Now, I've talked about this before. It's a bit of my hobby horse. I'm not going not gonna to run down this rabbit trail today. But my experience of the church growing up in the church over the last number of years is that often the church is known for being more interested in the beginning of the sentence and the word repent than we are at the end, to the words at the end of the sentence. And this concept of nearness and what that tells us about God. 
and I have to be really, really well behaved at this point because I had to cut a whole bunch of stuff I loved out of my sermon to get it down to the, the right size about this. But one of the things that my research has kicked up over the last couple of months around this is the word that Matthew uses here for near. It's actually used, at that time it was used for people to describe who their next of kin was, who was nearest to them. The new thing that God was doing, Matthew wants us to understand, had to do with family. It had to do with inheritance. It had to do with legacy. The kingdom of God was near. It's about who, this whole concept of family, who was the family of God, was being redefined. Not specific bloodline, one type of person, one people group, but all people everywhere. And if we weren't sure about that, we find it cropping up again in verse 19, if you've still got the text open in front of you. These words about fishing for people. Imagine of all the things that Jesus could have invited people in to do, this is the language that he's speaking. Now he's speaking to fishermen, so I suppose in that sense, in the broader sense, it makes sense. But it's fishing for people he speaks to them about, which we know if, we, if we're familiar with the rest of Matthew's gospel, I'm thinking particularly of chapter 28, where we get this amazing almost climax in the gospel called the Great Commission where Jesus, we see, um, charging the apostles to go and enlist all the Gentiles to be um, as, disi as disciples, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. It, it, it's just an odd thing here, but the, the word that Matthew uses for show here in verse 19, it's important too because it actually means to, to do or to make something inferring that people in this new thing that God is doing, we're not called just to be believers in it, to be theorists in terms of what it means to be a follower of Jesus, to be a, one of his disciples. But actually what, what, what he's saying here is that what's really of significance and importance is that we are full-blown participants in this new kingdom this rule and reign of Jesus Christ on the earth in the power of the Spirit. He doesn't want to do that on his own. He wants each of us to do that with him. Why? Maybe that's one of the questions we can ask. <laughs> but he does. He loves us. He wants us to be involved in what he's doing. And he calls us to partner with him in his kingdom. All of which brings us to chapter 5. If you've got the, the text open in front of you, just uh, follow along for uh, just a moment longer. Matthew has already told us quite a bit about Jesus, but here in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 5, he hones in with an even greater clarity. If you remember from earlier in chapter 4, we're told about a people who are sitting in darkness. And now we're told about the teacher who sits down to teach. There's this correlation, this connection. Although they're very, very different words, there's this correlation of, uh, and again, I had to, it's a hobby horse of mine, of this way that God calls us to live out of rest with him. So he doesn't come on a big horse and a big scepter and a big, he's not walking around the top of this mountain trying to, you know, will people to do this. He just comes and in modeling the peace of God, he sits down. He has nothing to prove. He knows exactly who he is and what he's come to do. And so the person who calls us to follow after him models peace and rest. What's amazing is that the language that Matthew uses here to describe what Jesus does, it actually means, the word for sit here, it means to recline for a meal. That's a conversation all of itself to be able to talk about the hospitality of God. Because re the reality is, and remember, Matthew is a gospel written to Jewish people, to Jewish believers. Jews only sat down to eat with family. 
we are the same when we both sit down at a table. We are the same level. And that's the message of the kingdom. You belong to me. You are my family. We are the same. You, are, you belong in what I'm doing. It's so deep and so rich. Here is the shepherd who has come to feed his sheep. Here is the shepherd who has come to meet our every need. And just as the Torah, we're told, the commentators go on to say, just as the Torah was given to Moses on Mount Sinai, Jesus is presented to us here as Matthew, by Matthew as the king sitting on his throne and his disciples are kind of like approaching him like subjects in a royal court. Everyone is just longing to hear his inaugural address. Matthew is that he is, you can probably see in my animation, he is a master communicator. He has us exactly where he wants us, a sitting on the edge of our seat. What is the king about to say? About who he is and what he's doing? What is the king about to say about my life? What, it's really, what it really means to be a human? What purpose can my life on the earth really have? It seems to me like the world is asking these questions too. Maybe they're just asking different, they're using different language. As I've looked at Twitter and Facebook and the news this week, I see a world travailing, longing to know the certainty of the shepherd who feeds and meets our needs. So it's important, and I think one of the things that, that I suppose that kind of, that check that we need to carry into our dealing and our treatment of this passage is that we, this is not just a list of things to do. A ninefold path to Jesus. Like he's waiting for us to do things in the right way, in the right order. This is the ninefold fold, nine volt, and it's like some kind of kingdom battery. Uh, it's the ninefold path of Jesus. This is what God is like. The Beatitudes show us. They, they show us not just Jesus well-wishing, but he lived this. His engagement, his interactions, not just with the poor and marginalized, we'll talk about that in a minute, but with all people everywhere. He made space for them. And in the same way that Jesus only did and said what the Father told him to, the new family that God is building will be those who tread out with Jesus the kingdom manifesto that we can see here in verses 3 to 12. We're called to be full-blown participants in the inbreaking now and not yet kingdom of God. And these words are a little bit of a map for how we might be like Jesus in our generation for the sake of the world. A world that needs it, don't you agree? A world that is longing for the fullness of God's kingdom. Which at last brings us to verse three and to the first beatitude. So why don't you look at it with me? I wanna read it just one more time for us. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, one of the first things that we need to get clarity on together um, here with verse 3 is the word poor. It can become a bit of an obstacle for us. Otherwise, what we're all, all we're going to do is see these opening words as nothing more than God's generous admittance of those who are lesser off from a monetary point of view into all that he's doing. And I have no problem with that. I have no doubt that this is true based on what we can see, what Jesus is doing and saying and in acting amongst the poorest of people and the marginalized of people, not just in this gospel, but right the way through the New Testament. 
But that's not, in fact, the meaning of what Jesus is saying here in verse 3. One of the things um, that one of the things that Jesus is alluding to here in verse 3 is the messianic prophecy from Isaiah 61 that speaks about good news being proclaimed to the poor. The, the poor in spirit were originally Jewish exiles who had lost their land, their city, their temple, and even their status as the people of God because of their sin and disobedience. God had asked them to live in a certain type of way amongst the people of the world, and they had forfeited that. They'd struck out on their own, and they found themselves desperately reaching out, needing, throwing themselves on the mercy of God. And it is right to this heart of the instinct towards autonomy that Jesus' words about poverty are aimed. Let me just say that again. It is right to the heart of this instinct toward autonomy that Jesus' words about poverty are aimed. And with his deliberate reference to Isaiah 61 here in verse 3, he is declaring that this ancient promise of blessing was being extended to anyone who could see the poverty of their own lives and their need for God to heal, forgive, and restore them. Just think for a moment if you will, of the words of the Roman centurion whose servant was dangerously ill. Lord, I do not deserve you to come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. What happens? The kingdom breaks in. Or think of what Peter's shock causes him to blurt out at the, at the, the lakeside after the miraculous catch of fish. Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. The kingdom of God breaks in. And remember, too, Paul's declaration to the young Timothy. Christ came into the world to save sinners, of which I am the worst. The kingdom of God crashes in. Simply put, the poor in spirit are those who have no inflated estimations of their own importance and have abandoned any pursuit of life on our own terms, choosing instead a vision of life with God at the center and as their source. This is the kind of living that Jesus calls blessed. God first. God at the center. God in all things is the kind of living that Jesus calls blessed. But it's easier said than done. There's no way I could stand here as your pastor and and promise you blue skies and calm seas as we try to live this out together, however much I want to. This first beatitude requires huge amounts of honesty and humility as we work it out together. Let's think about the honesty part first. Practice a bit of of vulnerability as I do that. It is not easy to admit when and where we have messed up. Am I alone in that? It is never easy to admit when we have messed up. But even more than that, nobody really wants to come to terms with the fact that we are caught in a trap that we can't escape from. I always found this fascinating on the Alpha course. We've run it here for decades as a church. Do you believe in such a thing as that there's such a thing called sin in the world? And anyone on any point toward accepting or exploring the Christian faith would come and go, yeah, yeah, I, 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 I believe this sin. Do you believe you're a sinner? Mm, I'm not sure if what, what I do or the way I think or how I act. I don't know if that constitutes. I'm sure other people are, but not me. And this propensity for striking out on our own and working to ensure that we are never dependent or out of control or lacking anything is something that each of us needs to learn how to carry into God's presence and, and say, Lord, I've done it again. I'm doing it again. I don't know how to stop this. I seem to be just bent on this way of thinking and living and into the place 
of community where we can honestly own the fact that we do that together. Looking at one another. Sorry, I, I, I've, I've acted in this way again. God isn't at the center of this area of my life. God isn't at that center. I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? Learning to confess honestly the poverty of where God is not first and where we have turned our backs on his love and marred his image in us. I've wondered all weekend how we might answer these questions. What is the greatest area of poverty in your life? Where do you feel like you don't have enough or are not enough? That's what these words of Jesus are designed to get us reflecting on. Being honest about that and learning to bring it before God. Say, Lord, I'm sorry. I've done it again. I'm essentially just living without you. You're not first. I can see that. Help me to come back to you. The invitation to be poor in spirit involves embracing the kingdom posture of open-handed trust. I put this image up. This, this sense in which when we're faced with the inevitable lack in our lives, the poverty within us, we have a choice. Which will we choose? Where will we look? To whom will we turn? When the chips are down and we become aware of our deep need, what, do we try to meet that on our own? Do we run to addictive behaviors? Do we run to controlling behaviors? What is it that we do? Will we follow those fear instincts and close our hands in anxiety, trying to make our, say, our path safe for ourselves, or will we open our hands in childlike trust and walk with him? So after honesty comes humility. It's another important requirement of what it means to be poor in spirit. As we learn to admit when and where we've made mistakes, that's the honesty part, we are invited to have the courage to apologize and ask for forgiveness too. This is the humility part. We're invited to swallow our pride and to throw off the of our avoidance of admitting our need for help. I don't know about you, but I suck at that. <laughs> I struggle with that so much. Maybe you can relate. Being willing to admit where we need help. What about you? We're being invited to have the courage to apologize, to ask for forgiveness, to swallow our pride, to throw off any avoidance behaviors where we have to admit that we need help and choose instead to throw ourselves on the healer of our souls whose kingdom is breaking in around us. But why is this all so important? I suppose I want to suggest as we make this journey into the Beatitudes, the bottom line is this. I think the world needs people with honest humility. People who have taken up the challenge of following the example of Jesus. One of the, my favorite scriptures about Jesus is this. It's, it describes him as the one who made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant who humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. He didn't hold on to any of his power. In fact, he gave it all up. We too are called to be part of this great flow of God's abundance in the world, his kingdom coming onto the earth, into history, into time and space, to open our hands in trust, to receive, and to share what we have with others. We practiced a little bit about that earlier on. Anxiety 
it, all it does is breed scarcity and greed. Whereas gratitude fuels a sense of abundant, abundance, contentment, and generosity. If there was ever a time we needed to be reminded of this, it's now. We're being modeled a very different picture of power at the moment. Not looking out for others, but out of scarcity and greed, trying to take something from others. That's on, there's so many different levels that we jar with what's happening in the Ukraine, but at its most <coughs> base level, I believe that's one of the things. It's just so out of kilter with the rule and reign of God. And as children of God, each of us are connected to that. Even if we're not going around thinking about it all, the you see something and you, your heart just, you just, like in your gut, you just go, that is wrong. That shouldn't happen. People shouldn't be treated like that. Millions of people shouldn't be displaced. That is wrong. That's anti the kingdom of God. Of course we sense injustice. But this is the kind of living that Jesus calls blessed. God at the center, God first. Not holding on out of fear and greed and scarcity, but just saying, all I have is yours. Jesus, let your kingdom come in my life. I surrender to your will and to your ways. Nobody else can pray it for you. You have to say it yourself. To the one who is the healer of our souls, who knows us better than we know ourselves. The Beatitudes invite us to move from closed-handed anxiety to open-handed trust. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. May we own our poverty, celebrate the reality of God's abundance, live with open hands, and walk in the way of trust. Let's stand together.